Welcome to Common Fractures, COVID edition. I'm your host. And today we're gonna to talk about common fractures. And after listening to this, you should have a basic understanding of how and why certain fractures occur and general fracture mechanisms and how they can affect treatment. Also appreciate the foots like a hand, but with fewer skills, kind of like a cousin that we don't really talk about very much, so we'll keep moving. Here are the objectives. Identify several common fractures, understand fracture deformity and mechanism, which gets back to anatomy, um, identify why certain fractures do not readily heal, and understand the basic principles of fracture treatment. And if time, you'll get to do some surgery on some real patients and fix fractures. Well, not really, but it sounds exciting. Um, introduction. So. The hand, um, which we're gonna do upper extremity fractures um, for the most part in this talk. The hand is really an amazing organism. It defines most of our tactile interaction with the outside world. This is obviously coming from a hand surgeon, so I'm gonna be a little bit biased. Um, it's uniquely specialized compared to all of the other inhabitants of the planet. It has multiple different types of nerve receptors for position sense, vibration, temperature, fine tactile discrimination, in fact, in order to read Braille, you have to be able to sense points that are two millimeters apart. And I don't know if you know that Dr. Severin actually produced with his wife a Braille anatomy textbook um, that he was working on back a long time ago when I was doing my master's thesis, so sometime in the early 90s. Um, unlike almost all non-primates, we have opposable thumbs. That with our mediocre brains helps us develop the fine motor, schools, motor skills necessary not to speak, but to develop and refine tools. Um, if dolphins, this is an article from The Onion, if dolphins ever oppose, develop, uh, if dolphins ever evolve and develop opposable thumbs, we are just totally finished as a species. Um, this is a, this is a, what they would probably do, start building tools and breathing apparatuses and whatever. So, um, wrist anatomy. The wrist is comprised of two rows of carpal bones that you'll remember from Gross. Um, the scaphoid kind of is a link between the two rows. So think of this row here where you have basically the hamate, capitate, trapezoid, and trapezium, and the proximal row really consists of the scaphoid, lunate, and triquetrum. Pisiform kinda is along for the ride because it's sitting on the front of the carpus, um, but the scaphoid really occupies space in both the proximal and distal carpal rows and performs a very important role. It serves as a link between those two rows and they'll become relevant in a little bit. And of course, the rest of the wrist, the metacarpals and the distal radius and ulna. Um, the structure of the forearm and hand allows for multi-planar motion. The wrist can deviate radially, it can deviate ulnarly, it can flex, it can extend, and then there's rotation, most of which occurs through the forearm, which is pronation, palm down, supination, palm up but also there's a little bit of pronation and supination that occurs within the hand, opposition of the thumb. The thumb and the first metacarpal are pronating in order to reach over to the little finger, and the little finger actually supinates a little bit too, mostly at the metacarpal level. Um, we'll talk about the scaphoid first. Scaphoid is a unique bone. It's almost completely intraarticular. It's almost completely covered with cartilage. So if you recall from the bone pathology and some of the fracture healing you've heard about in the course, um, it, ha it doesn't have any periosteum. So that mechanism of fracture healing is not available for the scaphoid because you can't, you can't form a callus. The fracture is usually in the middle of a joint. So it's bathed in joint fluid and there's no periosteum to contribute healing cells to the fracture. So any kind of unstable fracture where the pieces are really separated is going to be penetrated with joint fluid and have a tough time healing. And even well-aligned fractures will take a long time to heal for a couple different reasons, which we'll get into next. Well, not right next, but pretty soon. Um, fracture mechanism. When you see it, an x-ray, um, it tells you something about the fracture mechanism. For example, here is a pediatric elbow. How do I know it's a pediatric elbow? Well, because this bone isn't missing. This is the radius, this is the ulna, this is the humerus, but this is all cartilage. So there's actually a structure going all the way up here. You just don't see it because it's still cartilage. It hasn't completely ossified yet. So, um, like we talked about with tendon and um, muscle origin injuries, the rate and magnitude of force um, it really determines where the fracture occurs. So in kids, because the growth plates are made out of cartilage, a rapid load will fail through the bone. 
Um, whereas in an adult where the bone is fully formed, you may just injure the ligament or, or tendon. So here, in this case, this is a uh, epicondylar fracture where basically the, the soft tissue attachment to the bone was stronger than the attachment of the bone through the growth plate, so it gets pulled off. That's known as an avulsion fracture. Role of deforming forces in fracture displacement. You can tell a lot about a fracture by looking at an x-ray in terms of the fracture mechanism. Things that affect it, basically the direction of force and how rapidly it was applied, the shape of the bone, and also the surrounding anatomy. So here it did basically, and again, this is a femur, but it applies to almost any long bone fracture and uh, tibia, humerus, um, middle of radius, middle of the ulna. Um, the phalanges and metacarpals are kind of like really tiny long bones um, just because of the uh, um, similar shape. Transverse fracture like this, basically, this is a fracture that occurs from a force that's applied relatively perpendicular to the bone. Linear, um, the bone is very strong um, when an axial force is applied, and so if you have a really strong axial force, you may get a little bit of a linear fracture. This is a super uncommon mode of fracture. Oblique fractures, um, again, displaced and non-displaced, means the force... Thank you for one second. <coughs> I'm really sorry Oh, that's that. okay. <coughs> Just pick it up. Okay. okay. Oblique fractures, whether displaced or non-displaced, means that the force was also applied at an oblique angle. Um, and spiral fractures have a twisting mechanism to them. That's really important um, in, in different populations. If you see a non-ambulatory um, infant with a spiral fracture, then that's child abuse until proven otherwise, because there's no way that that a non-ambulator can generate enough force to have a twisting fracture to their femur. I mean, there are kind of really unique things. Maybe they got their foot caught in the crib and fell out of the crib funny, but that's a red flag kind of fracture. If you see a spiral fracture in a non-ambulator, then you have to contact Child Protective Services. And it doesn't mean every time it happens it's child abuse. It just means that every time you see that fracture, you have to be thinking about that. Um, green stick fractures, these occur, this is not really a great depiction of a green stick fracture. A green stick fracture occurs through kind of more flexible bone. It's a pediatric fracture where the bone kind of, um, like a green stick, part of it will break and part of it will, will stay intact and it's more of a bendy kind of fracture. Comminuted fracture where you have multiple pieces of bone, that just tells you that there was more force applied to the fracture. And again, age has a big bearing. A comminuted fracture in an 80 year old does not take a lot of force because the bone's not great. They're osteoporotic, they may fall on the radius or get a hip fracture, and you're gonna have lots of bone fragments at the fracture site. If a 20 year old has a comminuted fracture, there had to have been a lot more force applied, like a motorcycle accident or something like that. So it's just, again, all these, fract uh, these factors together can help you understand the personality of the fracture. And really, each fracture does sort of have its own personality and that affects the treatment to a great deal. Now, again, we're going to get back to the scaphoid for a second. Why do some bones in the hand heal better than others? And here's the scaphoid. Again, when you see a topic with three or four bullet points, it often ends up on a test. Um, the scaphoid is the most commonly fractured carpal bone. Um, obviously, radius fractures are, are not, but the radius is not a carpal bone. Radius fractures are probably more common than scaphoids. Metacarpal, also not a carpal because it's got a totally different name with meta in the front probably more common than scaphoid fractures. Of the carpal bone fractures, the scaphoid is the most commonly injured bone. With proper care, 90 to 95% of scaphoid fractures heal. That sounds great. Anytime you have like 95%, 90% chance, that sounds good for a fracture, that is actually terrible. If you have a metacarpal fracture or a radius fracture, those are gonna have nearly a 100% healing rate. So, scaphoids, do a lot worse than other fractures in the same vicinity. Why? Um, let's talk about mechanism of injury. The scaphoid, um, because of the link between the proximal and distal carpal row, when you break that link, and the fracture usually occurs for bending the scaphoid over the radial styloid. So it gets caught between the trapezium and the radial styloid and the scaphoid breaks in the middle. 
but then once it breaks, the distal scaphoid kind of stays with the distal row and the proximal scaphoid stays with the proximal row. So every time you move your wrist, the two fragments are moving together. Mostly, the scaphoid is moving with the lunate, the proximal scaphoid. And so that's why it can be, that's one of the reasons why scaphoid fractures have a tough time healing. Um, here are the other ones. And again, just not to beat this, you know, too much, but here are four bullet points. That would be really easy to write a test question um, about scaphoids. For those of you um, watching on double speed, four bullet points often equals testable material. It's hard to do a whole lecture like that. I don't think I could handle it. I'm sure you couldn't either. So, um, no, you know, why should you? Uh, poor blood supply. Um, the scaphoid has a very poor blood supply. We'll get into that in a second. Delayed diagnosis. You can have a crack in the scaphoid. And if the fracture is not displaced, it's not going to show up on radiographs right away. So someone can fall onto their hand, have an actual scaphoid fracture, present to the emergency department, get a radiograph, and the radiograph can be totally normal. Because if the fracture is not displaced um, and the bone's being held together by cartilage, um, you're not going to see it right away. So any patient who you see in the emergency department who has tenderness in the anatomic snuff box, which is a great place to palpate the scaphoid or over the volar scaphoid. If they have scaphoid tenderness, treat it presumptively like a fracture. You can either bring them back in three or four weeks um, in x-ray, because at that point, most likely if there is a fracture, you'll see it, or an MRI can aid in early diagnosis. MRI is positive almost right away if someone has a scaphoid fracture. Why don't scaphoids show up right away? Well, if the bone's not displaced, you're not gonna see it on x-ray and why they show up later. One of the responses to fracture healing is growing blood vessels across the fracture site and trying to lay down some tissue at the fracture site, which ultimately will um, turn into cartilage and then turn back into bone to heal the fracture. That whole mechanism of fracture healing um, will be visible because early in that, you're gonna get a little bone resorption at the fracture site, which is when the fracture becomes visible at about three or four weeks in a completely non-displaced scaphoid. Um, here's another reason the scaphoid doesn't heal. It's intraarticular. It's almost completely covered in cartilage, so you can't have any callus. Uh, mechanical instability, we talked about that. So the four reasons scaphoids have a tough time healing, poor blood supply, delayed diagnosis, intraarticular location, and mechanical instability. Here's a little picture of the scaphoid blood supply. Also, if you take, take your bone out and take a picture of it on a slide, not a good sign for you. Um, so here is basically a cross section through the scaphoid. This is the distal scaphoid where the trapezium is, and this is the proximal scaphoid where the radius is. So there's a single vessel which enters the dorsal scaphoid coming off of the radial artery, and it supplies the blood from distal to proximal. There's a little small vessel here at the scaphoid tuberosity, but again, it doesn't contribute much to fracture healing. This is the main, this is the main vessel. And enters dorsally and radially and goes from distal to proximal. So the further you are away from this vessel, so you have a proximal pole fracture, again, the blood supply is very poor. So the, the closer you get to the radius, the longer it takes the fracture to heal and the higher the rate of fracture non-healing. Here's what I was talking about with the MRI. So undisplaced fractures are, are often not evident on initial radiographs, maybe not even for two or three or four weeks. Um, so this is what an MRI looks like. This is a different MRI than the one we looked at earlier. This is a T1 um, or a low spin MRI. And this one, fat, which is your subcutaneous fat and bone marrow look bright. This, for, this scaphoid, you can see a line going across there and it doesn't have normal fat intensity because there's a little edema because the bone is broken. So this is what a scaphoid looks like on a T1 or a low spin image. How do you improve scaphoid healing? Well, basically you can try and improve the blood supply and people try taking blood vessels or bone with a, with a new blood supply and moving it to the scaphoid Kind of makes sense if you take bone with blood supply and plug it in there, you can take bone from the radius, or you can, which is a, a pedicle graft, meaning you'll just detach the bone here with a vessel on it and plug it into the fracture site. Um, or you can take distant bone, like the medial femoral condyle with a blood vessel, sew the blood vessel into the ra radial artery and attach that to the scaphoid. Um, makes sense, but hasn't really 
worked super well if you analyze the orthopedic literature. But anyway, so improving the blood supply in principle um, is one way to do it. The other way is to restore mechanical stability. So having a screw across the fracture can apply stability and compressive force, both of which are very good for fracture healing. So this is a patient who had a scaphoid fracture right here, and this is a screw placed from distal to proximal. And if you look really carefully, you'll see these threads are more visible than here. Because for any of you woodworkers out there, if you have threads crossing two pieces of wood that you want to squeeze together, it's hard to do that, right? You'd want ideally a glide hole where, where the screw's not really getting a good purchase. And then so that as you tighten the screw, it brings the pieces together. Well, this is called a variable pitch screw. These threads are farther apart. So as you tighten the screw, it does bring these pieces um, closer together and, and applies more compressive force. There are things we're working on on how to improve scaphoid healing. Um, one is to take a bone morphogenic protein, which is a recombinant protein, which helps fracture healing. Preliminary results, so that helps a little bit. So basically, fracture healing in general, it's always a question of biology and mechanics. So improving the blood supply or putting a protein in to help with fracture healing, that's really a biologic improvement. Restoring mechanical stability is, is uh, again, that's well, it's got mechanical in it, so that's more of a mechanical solution, and usually it's a combination of both. A um, couple other, a few other common fractures of the hand and wrist, distal radius fractures, carpal fractures, a couple different kind of metacarpal fractures, and phalangeal fractures. So this is a distal radius fracture. This is the most common fracture of the hand and wrist, usually caused by foosh, fall on an outstretched hand. Um, and also usually occurs along with an ulnar styloid fracture and usually because people are falling on their hand as the apex volar, meaning the apex is volar or palmar and causes what's known as a dinner fork deformity if you don't put it back in place. Now this is an adult here because you don't see any open growth plates. Kids, be, um, because they have open growth plates made out of cartilage, will usually fail through the growth plate. Um, in case you're, you're not sure, this is a dinner fork. So you can go back and forth and compare this to the deformity. And I guess if you have the fork on its side, that could kind of look like a dinner fork a little bit. It's got little fingers at the end. Um, we don't change the number of tines based on salad or, 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 or dinner fork because that wouldn't be right. Um, so treatment of radius fracture depends on the age of the patient and the degree of deformity. Um, if you have someone who's under 40, and you re reduce their deformity, put their fracture back in place, it's much more likely to stay in place. Once you get past 40 or 50, the fracture is much more likely to not stay in place. You can get initially get the bones repositioned, but it will settle due to the poorer quality of the bone. Um, a certain amount, healing with a certain amount of deformity is actually okay. And there are plenty of studies that show even though your arm will look a little crooked, it will work fine and not really affect your ability to use it. So that's had an impact, particularly in the last couple of years, we probably operate on fewer geriatric fractures because you're not really changing the functional level very much. Um, surgery, when do we do surgery? Um, when there's unacceptable deformity, um, when someone has multiple extremity injur injuries. So if someone has like a broken leg or two broken legs, um, they may need their arms for ambulation. If you fix their fracture, they can probably ambulate using their arms sooner. So that may be a reason to uh, fix it. And also early return to desired activity. So if someone doesn't want to wear a cast or they want to get back to doing something, um, I broke my wrist, I had it fixed surgically and was doing surgery nine days later, which I wouldn't necessarily advise because it was sort of stupid and painful. But anyways, um, having a rigid internal fixation will allow you to return to cast-free activity sooner. Um, this is known as a ORIF, which is Open Reduction Internal Fixation. Um, beautiful job. This is the plate and screws holding the fracture together. This is called a locking plate where these screws actually lock into the plate to provide a fixed angle to hold the articular surface where it's supposed to be. This is a perfect reduction. All the measured parameters, which we won't get into because it's a little bit uh, beyond the level of the course, but this is anatomy has been completely restored. This is what we call an OIF which is the, the R is missing. So it's open internal fixation where you take a fracture, you don't reduce it, and just stick a plate on it, which is not a really good idea, but it happens maybe a little more than it should. Um, and so here we have a radius, which it's extended. This is a, a, a lateral. So, they, so this is the view that you're looking at. Um, this plate was put in through the volar surface, the radius, but the fracture wasn't reduced. 
So the plate's prominent, the deformity is still there, um, and so, yeah, so we try and avoid the so-called OIF or open internal fixation without the actual reduction. Um, and this is just uh, the response to an OIF, which is the OIV. Um, boxer's fracture. Boxer's fracture shouldn't really be called boxer's fractures because boxers who generally know how to punch. Metacarpals are very strong along their long axis, so if boxer is punching someone or, or, or a martial artist is striking a board or a person, the axis of the strike compressing along the long axis of the metacarpal is very strong. If someone's taking a big wild swing or punching a wall, again, the force is applied obliquely, so you develop fractures. Um, and usually these occur from striking another person, or a wall, or a lamppost, or a fire hydrant. Um, you know, not usually in the boxer. Um, people have all sorts of great reasons for getting these. I, I, I had a, a woman with one, like her husband was sitting with her cowering in the corner and said, well, I hit the wall because I didn't want to hit him because those were obviously the only two options. Um, usually these are treated with reduction and immobilization. Um, when do you have to fix these? Well, the fourth and fifth metacarpals move a lot more at the carpal metacarpal joint. So I make a fist and then I do this. You can tell how much more flexion there is in the fourth and fifth metacarpals. So when you get closer to the little finger side of the hand because there's more motion at the carpal metacarpal joint, you can tolerate more deformity. The second and third metacarpals have almost no motion at the carpal metacarpal joint, so you can't tolerate as much deformity. So if you have a fracture that's angulated of the second or a third metacarpal, those are most likely to need some type of um, reduction and uh, fixation if the reduction is not stable enough to stand on its own. Um, Bennett's fracture. This is a great fracture for talking about. It's a great fracture for tests because it's a very common fracture and it has a common mechanism of deformity. Um, and, and, you know, it really takes anatomy into it because in order to understand the deformity, you have to kind of remember your anatomy. So a Bennett's fracture is an intraarticular fracture of the first metacarpal caused by an axial force on a on a, uh, a flex metacarpal. So falling or hitting something, um, common sports injury. People have a lot of motion at, at, in the base of their thumb. Women particularly, or anyone with kind of generalized ligaments laxity, well, when you adduct the thumb, the metacarpal subluxes off the trapezium just a little bit. If you have force that's applied axially, um, while that metacarpal is not sitting on the trapezium, the part that was sitting on the trapezium stays there, the rest of the metacarpal doesn't. So here's the fracture, here's the piece staying on the trapezium, here's the rest of the metacarpal being pulled proximally. So it's the abductor pollicis longus, which, and here's where the anatomy comes in, it's the abductor pollicis longus, abductor, which pulls it proximally, it's the adductor pollicis, which adducts the first metacarpal, and also, the, the EPL has a little bit of a role, but for just don't worry about that uh, at the moment. So, the free fragment is really held in place by very stout ligaments that connected to the trapezium, and the rest of the metacarpal is just pulled proximally and adducts. So, this is an unstable fracture. It doesn't want to stay in place because of the, the strong pull of the deforming muscles. So this is one that we generally fix. So it, when, you're, when you're either casting someone or doing surgery, you want to neutralize the deforming forces. Um, here are a couple of different ways to do it. One is taking a, it's just a K wire called a Kirshner wire, where you don't worry about the fragment and you pin the metacarpal to the trapezium. In, in real life, you'd want to use a really beefy wire and have it go all the way into the trapezium and maybe add a second wire into the second metacarpal to stabilize it because just having interfragmentary fixation where you're pinning just across the fragment, particularly if it's a small fragment, probably isn't stable enough for that to be your definitive fixation. Um, if you have a bigger fragment, you can put screws in. This is something we use in athletes all the time if they have a big fragment because you can't send someone back to play if they have a pin across a joint because if you try and do that, um, one of my other jobs, I'm the uh, team hand consultant for the Bills and Sabres, if you send and you be in a couple other people, um, if you have someone play with a pin crossing a joint and they have an impact, even in a cast, the pin can shear off at the joint level. So that's not a really good thing to do. You can't let someone play with transarticular pins. So if you can get a screw across the fracture um, and get good compression of the fragments, they can probably return to play a little bit sooner. Um, in orthopedics, as I said, we neutralize things with metal because it's fun and effective, which is why you know most of us go into orthopedics. Mental note. Um, Phalangeal fractures, very common. Um, 
Same pattern as any other long bone fracture, so tibia, femur, et cetera. They're just really small long bones. A volume fracture is going to occur, and that's what we showed that elbow thing at the beginning. A volume fracture involves the insertion of structures that pull off a piece of bone when they fail. I'll show a couple of those. Uh, this is a baseball or mallet finger, where it's often occurring from jamming your finger, and um, it can fail through bone, with, where, where the, the terminal extensor pulls off a piece of the bone and it fractures, or it can just be a purely a soft tissue mallet entry in which the tendon ruptures. Um, treatment for that, basically this is a bony mallet which we treated with a single pin, or these also do really well with uh, different types of splints. The common factor between these splints is they're all holding the DIP joint in full extension, which is really all you need. So mallet fingers often don't require surgery unless you're taking care of someone who for whatever reason can't tolerate a splint or can't work with a splint. Surgeons, when they get mallet fingers, often prefer to have a pinning so they can keep operating uh, because it'll cut the, the pin off like this, just below the skin surface and leave it in until it's healed and then pull it out with, you know, numbing up first depending on, you know, who it is. Um, bony skier's thumb. We're getting towards the end. Um, it occurs when the ulnar collateral ligament of the thumb um, pulls off a piece of bone. A regular soft tissue skier's thumb, no fracture, just rupture of the ligament. And it's basically the ulnar collateral ligament of the metacarpal phalangeal joint. Skier's thumb implies, whether it's bony or soft tissue, implies an acute injury. It's not a gamekeeper thumb, that's different. Um, the treatment for skier's thumb, basically the ulnar collateral is really important because the ulnar collateral ligament stabilizes the thumb and pinch. If that ligament is torn or if, if it's pulled off with a piece of bone, when I pinch, my thumb is going to keep going and I'll lose all my pinch strength. So this shows a little schematic um, of a translucent patient I had taken care of uh, recently. Um, and this is the ligament failed here. And you fix it by basically taking the ligament and reattaching it to the bone. So if it's unstable, ligament is completely torn and displaced, um, you fix it. In the case of skier's thumb, also the ad, if you have a complete tear, the adductor aponeurosis can be interposed between the torn ligament and the bone. And so in those cases, you, you have to fix it, otherwise it's not gonna heal. Again, that won't be uh, testable for this. Um, gamekeeper's thumb. Not an acute injury. People always say, oh, I have a, a gamekeeper. No, gamekeeper is a gradual attenuation of the ligament from repetitive force over time, usually from wringing the, the neck of mostly dead game. I'm referred to uh, Princess Bride for the meaning of mostly dead. Um, no time to show the actual scene um, with Billy Crystal. Um, just to be clear, no actual bunnies were injured in the preparation of this lecture, but this shows from wringing the neck over time that the gamekeepers get gradual attenuation and failure of that ligament. All right, that's it for this talk.